All right, welcome to this special primary night edition of WUSA 9 News. I'm Lorenzo Hall. We've been following the races in D.C. and Virginia all day, and we're going to bring you the results as they come in. You can also find them scrolling right there at the bottom of your screen. We're also going to check in with our crews for live reports from two of the D.C. candidates for mayor, Muriel Bowser and Robert White. Their watch parties are happening right now. Adam Longo is also joining me tonight, tracking all the races in Virginia and talking about why this year is so different and so crucial. But let's get to the big one, the Democratic primary for D.C.'s mayor, who will likely be the next mayor. Right now, you can see here, incumbent Muriel Bowser is at 56 percent, with 50 percent of the precincts reporting. Uh, council member Robert White at 34 percent. You also have fellow council member Trayon White at 7 percent and James Butler, who ran back in 2018 at just 2 percent. Let's start in D.C. right now. It's a big night for Mayor Bowser as she runs for a historic third term. Our Delia Gonzalez is at her official campaign watch party at Franklin Hall just off New Street in Northwest. And uh, Delia, I take it the mayor loves uh, the numbers she's seen so far. Yeah, the mayor's supporters are here um, at uh, venue. They've been here for about an hour so far. And as expected, when the Associated Press called the, may called the race for the mayor, there was an eruption of applause. But we are expecting the mayor to come here and make an announcement shortly. Everyone is anticipating uh, her arrival here. Uh, there was a bit of surprise, I should have to should say, among a lot of folks who were here and observers that so early into the night, the Associated Press calling the race uh, in favor of Mayor Bowser. At that point, just 30 percent of the precincts had reported results and the mail-in and special ballots were the only ballots that were counted. So about half of the typical primary ballots were counted at that point. We're talking about 48,000 voters, 48,000 ballots. A typical primary, for instance, last primary in 2018, there were about 98,000 registered voters who cast ballots and that's what they were anticipating. So very early on in the night, folks here with a lot of optimism, a lot of optimism, I should say, hoping um, that they can just sail into victory and a lot of hugs and applause uh, so far this evening. We do know since we are only about three blocks away from that devastating shooting over at Mochella, Crime is of utmost importance and on the minds of lots of voters and D.C. residents. So certainly we are anticipating the mayor to, uh, to talk about that tonight, to talk about her housing initiatives, her very bold plan to include more housing and to uh, include more black homeowners and black residents into the picture so they can become homeowners in the uh, district as well. So we know there are a lot of initiatives, a lot of plans that she started before the pandemic and then had to pause during the pandemic as the mayor ushered the district through the COVID-19 pandemic. And now that she says we're rebounding, this election, she said, came down to trust. Who did voters trust to get them out of the pandemic to rebuild the city, to bring us back better and stronger to get our kids back to learning and achieving and excelling in schools and to get this crime under control. So certainly that's what we're going to be looking for the mayor to address her crime plan, the 202 safe initiative, the summer initiative to connect residents to resources. And we know that has been a disconnect in some communities. A lot of folks that I've talked to said we are in crisis and we need the mayor to help us. We need support for the families who are struggling, some of them living east of the river, some of them who are involved in a cycle of violence, generational poverty and violence um, and crime that's affected so many families here in the district. Folks are really looking for the mayor to connect them to those resources, and that's what she is anticipating that initiative to do. And so certainly we are expecting her to talk about the crime, to talk about schools, to talk about the housing initiatives, and to talk about the homelessness um, and what she's done to put our unhoused neighbors into safe shelter. And so we are anticipating the mayor to come here shortly. Let's take a look at the room right now, just to see that it's really filled up in the last 30 minutes with a lot of 
green shirts. As you can imagine, those are her supporters who are coming here after working the polls all day long. We know this has been a very long day for Mayor Bowser, up at 7 a.m. Um, casting ballot, uh, casting a ballot last week, but up at 7 a.m. talking to voters at Turkey Thicket and has been making the rounds throughout all eight wards and will end here um, on Florida Avenue to thank her supporters for being with her throughout this fight. You know, the mayor really sailed to victory during her last primary election, uh, winning by 80% of the vote. And so certainly she faced a tough challenge this year uh, and this primary up against two council members and Robert White uh, making a significant showing with 35% uh, of the vote so far uh, that were uh, accounted for and that have been reported as of 8.30. So certainly we're waiting for more numbers to come in, but as we reported and as the Associ Associated Press has reported, it appears that Mayor Bowser has uh, can claim victory tonight for the primary and we'll move forward to the general election. So, yeah, now we got to wait to listen out for that mayor's uh, speech, but they're certainly uh, having a good time over there at her watch party at Franklin Hall there in D.C. And some of you might be wondering, how do they make these projections so quickly, like the Associated Press? As Delia was mentioning there, I don't know if you could hear it uh, under the music there, but they usually count the mailed votes first and then those early in-person voting. So we saw a substantial number of people voting early. So as soon as the polls closed at 8 o'clock, they started counting right away. And then they jumped to today's uh, voting in person. All right, now we want to get to one of the mayor's biggest challengers. Council member Robert White. Larry Miller is at his event at Hook Hall, a restaurant in Park View in Northwest. And uh, Larry, you know, throughout this campaign, especially toward the end, we kept hearing Robert White say some of his internal polling indicated that this was a virtual tie. So looking at these numbers right now, how is this campaign feeling? Yeah, Lorenzo, that's a really good question. You know, kind of going back to that issue of polling, we only got that one poll from the White campaign suggesting that both he and Bowser were in a statistical tie with one another and that they had the momentum to really pull this thing out in the end. Unfortunately, they've fallen short in doing that. To Delia's point, the race was called relatively quickly by the Associated Press. As a matter of fact, I was the one that alerted some of the people associated with the campaign, in fact, that they had lost uh, to Mayor Bowser. But that really hasn't dampened the mood here just yet. I want to give you a look now here at Hook Hall. You can see people are gathering, uh, many of them in their purple shirts saying Robert White for mayor. No doubt disappointment here uh, as it looks like and has it has been announced uh, that Robert White unfortunately will not secure uh, a win here in the primary. But, you know, he really tried to make the case in his closing arguments as leading as we were getting closer to Election Day uh, that he was really focused on crime. That has been the big issue with D.C. voters at the polls. Many of them concerned about the uptick in crime that we've seen as a result of the pandemic and really how the country has shifted from social unrest to issues with inflation to issues with employment as well. That sparking crime. Uh, one of the things that we heard from the White campaign is that uh, they wanted to focus on crime uh, really comprehensively, kind of attacking it from seven different perspectives, uh, looking specifically at some of those issues that contribute to crime, trying to address those in hopes of bringing down the level of crime that we've seen here especially the, the crime associated with young people uh, that we've seen in the city as of late. Uh, I'm told that Robert White is in the building. He will speak with us at some point. Uh, but again, the mood here still high given the news. Uh, again, that race being called for Mayor Bowser, Robert White, uh, unfortunately will not win the primary tonight. Uh, but one of the things when you hear from the campaign, uh, you kind of know Robert White having talked with him, that you get the sense that even if this wasn't a win for him tonight, that he's probably going to get back in this again at some other point. Again, that's just speculative. 
uh, but knowing what he's done, at least on the council side, having lost that race in 2014 and then running again and winning in 2016, we can suspect that he may run again. But of course, we'll have to ask those questions uh, once he's ready to talk with us again. He is in the building. His family is here as well. We expect him to talk about what he will do on the D.C. Council to address the issue of crime and how he will continue to serve the residents of D.C. in his capacity as a council member at large. Lorenzo? Yeah, he's certainly garnered a lot of support over the course of this campaign. All right, Larry Miller, thank you. We'll check back on with you shortly. But right now we want to check in on some of the other major races in D.C. and the race for attorney general to replace outgoing AG Carl Racine. You have Brian Schwalb at a 47 percent with 58 percent of the precincts reporting. You have Bruce Biva at 36 percent and Ryan Jones at 17 percent. Down to the many D.C. council spots up for grabs right now in the race for chairman of the council. You have incumbent Phil Mendelson at 55 percent with 61 percent of the precincts reporting and Aaron Palmer, his challenger there at 44 percent. And for the at-large council seat that's voted on by the entire city, you have incumbent Anita Bonds. Uh, she's been on the council, by the way, since 2012. This would be her third term she's seeking. She's at 38 percent. Nate Fleming, 27 percent, uh, along with Lisa Gore at 27 percent and Dexter Williams at 7 percent. Now, in the Ward 1 council member race, which includes neighborhoods that are familiar to all of you, like Columbia Heights, Shaw and U Street, you have incumbent there, Brianna Doe, at 47 uh, percent. She's been on the council since 2015. Sable Harris there at 21 percent and Salah Zapare at 32 percent. That's been a really interesting race, very contentious, too. Now to the race for Ward 3 council member to replace Mary Che, uh, which had a few candidates on the ballot who dropped out. You have Matthew Fruman. Uh, at 37%, Eric Goulet, uh, we lost that one, but I can tell you these are some of the remaining candidates. Bill Thomas, 6%, Ben Bergman, 5%, and Bo Finley at 5%. All right, now to the, uh, I believe we're going to go to the Ward 5 council race, if we can. There you go. Uh, to replace outgoing council member Kenya McDuffie, who was running for attorney general. Uh, you have Zachary Parker, 42 percent. Faith Gibson Hubbard, 23 percent. Vincent Orange at 17 percent. And we're going to keep cycling through these. I believe Gordon Fletcher, 12 percent. Kathy Henderson at 5 percent. And Gary Johnson at 1 percent. Now, in the race for D.C.'s House of Representatives seat, you have longtime incumbent Eleanor Holmes Norton with a whopping 87 percent. Wendy Hamilton at 6 percent and Kelly McHale Williams at 6 percent. Now, as for the shadow representative, uh, which is basically an, an elected D.C. statehood advocate, you have Oy Abaloa at 50 percent uh, with 51 percent of the precincts reporting and Linda Gray at 50 percent. So we're splitting that one up uh, at the moment, but still a long way to go. Now, it's also a big day for the Commonwealth, where they have a uh, handful of congressional seats up for grabs. And one city is picking a spot for their city council. Some of the races, by the way, have already been called because we know the polls closed at 7 p.m. in Virginia. Adam Longo is here now to cover all of that for us. Hey, Ads. Hey, Zoe. So, yeah, some of these races are actually still a little too close to call at this point. Now, this year in Virginia is going to look a little bit different because Virginia's congressional map, like all of the other ones across the country, unless you only have one congressman, like, you know, states like Montana, they, they got redrawn like many other states. So we're going to get into the implications of that, and we're going to show you sort of the old map versus the new map in just a second. First, I want to share uh, some results, so let's go right to that. First, to the Democratic primary in Virginia's congressional district number eight, uh, Don Beyer, who is seeking his fifth term, the incumbent. The Associated Press has called the race for Congressman Beyer. Uh, he was going up against uh, Victoria Virasinghe. She's uh, receiving 22 percent of the vote uh, at this point. Um, let's go ahead and look at the, the next race on the Republican side. This is now uh, the second district, which is down to Virginia Beach. This is a key race. and I'm going to talk about that here in just a second. All right. So Jen Kiggins has been declared the winner there by the Associated Press. Now, this area covers parts of Norfolk and Virginia Beach. Why this is, is significant is because redistricting has made this a much more competitive seat. The incumbent there, Elaine Luria, the Democrat, who's also on the January 6th committee. These two will now, Kiggins and Luria, will go up against each other in a district that President Biden would have won by two percentage points once you account for redistricting and put everything together. Kiggins, a former Navy pilot, Elaine Luria, a former Navy commander. So Navy versus Navy in this race. All right, let's move on to the Republican nomination in Virginia's third congressional district. Uh, that's where Terry Namkong and Ted Enquist are at this point. You can see uh, Namkong there 
declared the winner with 62% uh, uh, of the vote. Uh, Enquist uh, receiving 38% of the vote. Uh, in Virginia's sixth congressional district, this is a sweeping district that covers all the way north from Winchester and Front Royal down through Harrisonburg, Stanton and Roanoke, a district that President, uh, former President Trump won by 22 points. Ben Klein, the incumbent there, has been uh, called the winner. He's uh, seeking his third term here uh, as the Republican nominee, uh, de defeating Merritt Hale. And then we're going to go to the big uh, GOP race for Virginia's seventh district. Now this one... This one is a very interesting race. Okay, so the incumbent right now, Abigail Spanberger, she, she did not have uh, an opponent on the Democratic side. But here are your candidates on the Republican side. You can see they are very close. This race not called yet, despite the fact that it looks like we've got 93% uh, reporting. Again, we don't know what of that percent are the mail-in ballots. All three of these candidates that you're seeing on the screen, all three of them vying for that ultra-conservative uh, Trump base vote. Uh, you see Vega right there. She is the one who's in the lead right now. She's a former uh, Prince William County deputy and a former member of the Prince William County Board of Supervisors. So this is a race we're going to be watching closely because in District 7 there where Abigail Spanberger is right now, that is a district where if you look at the lines and how voters did in 2020, uh, President Biden would have won that district by seven points. Now we're going to switch gears to the Democratic primary. And I say that, by the way, because any district right now that's looking like it is a less than 10 point swing from what it was in 2020. That's what we're considering at this point to be a competitive district with President Biden obviously not very popular right now. This is where in a midterm election Republicans can make a real surge. Now we're going to look at the Virginia Democratic candidates on Manassas City Council. You can see how things shake out there. No winners declared at this point because you can see look these vote totals between the first and the second uh, place leaders right now. The incumbent Ralph Smith behind by it looks to be if I mouse right, 25 votes right now. This is why in these municipal elections, why every vote counts. And looking in third place, only back by uh, another 100 and what's that, Lorenzo? 112 votes behind, uh, give or take a few. Mm -hmm. uh, so this one's going to be close. We're going to be following this one. Now, come with me over here to our touchscreen monitor. I'm going to highlight some of the, uh, the differences here in what we're seeing between uh, the old map and the new map. So this is from our, our uh, reporting partners at CNN. So they've done a fantastic job putting this graphic together. So this is the old map here. If you take this full, you'll actually be able to see it better. Um, so if you're taking a look at the old map there, which is on the left-hand side of your screen, you can see how the districts are just massive, right? Look at that district in the center of your screen, all right? That's a district that includes Charlottesville. I mean, it stretches all the way north to Northern Virginia and all the way south to the North Carolina line. How can one person represent people living in all of those different geographic areas, of course, with different political concerns. Now let's come out here and see the new map. You can see that the districts are a little more compact. Um, the districts that are that are up for grabs right now, the ones that I mentioned, uh, Abigail Spanberger's district uh, in District 7. So that is right here, this blue district. So this includes, this goes up north. You see this, this light blue? I can make this bigger. Stand by. This light blue up here, this is Dale City, right? This district is going to stretch south. It's going to include Kiwanico, Triangle, Stafford, Fredericksburg, Spotsylvania. So that's Abigail Spanberger's district uh, where she's uh, going up against uh, a number of these uh, Republican candidates. There are actually six of them in this race right now, the top three vote getters right now, all vying for that very conservative, very Trump uh, base uh, voter. Now, I'm going to take you down here because I want to be able to show you more about this map. So. I'm going to zoom on out here so you can see this. All right, so let's see. Okay, so this is the, the Spanberger district here. Right down here in Virginia Beach, this is the Elaine Luria district, the Democrat I was mentioning who's on the January 6th committee. This district, uh, if you considered all of the voters in this area, would have voted uh, for Joe Biden by two points, which is a very narrow margin coming into this uh, midterm election. So that's where Jen Kiggins, the Navy pilot, is going to be going up against Elaine Luria here. Uh, uh, so I just wanted to highlight how all of these districts uh, are looking different now. The other districts, not, not so much competitive. I'm going to make this even bigger so I can show you. All right, um, where's my little paint tool? Why would it work? Okay, this area right in here, uh, this is Don Byers district, right? So this is a Biden plus 25 district. Don Byer has won in the Democratic primary. Don Beyer is going to win in the general election unless there's some sort of cataclysmic meltdown. Um, 
because it's just such a solid uh, Democratic district. So I mentioned the Virginia Be Beach District. Uh, in District 6 over here, this is uh, Ben Klein's district, the one again that's stretching from all the way in Front Royal, Winchester, all the way down and actually includes Roanoke, right? So you've got Stanton in here, you've got Waynesboro in here, you've got Harrisonburg in here. So this is a district that's Trump plus 22, if you consider the voters there. I guess my paint thing is working because now I have a big red dot on the map for absolutely no reason. So please pay zero attention to that, right? So in that Ben Klein district, because that's a Trump plus 22, district 22 points in, in 2020 it's basically if you win the republican primary you're going to win the general election again not counting for any sort of cataclysmic meltdown uh, abigail spanberger's district who uh, i mentioned here that is the one uh, coincidentally where the big red dot is i suppose um, so that is the biden plus seven district and again when i mentioned that if it's less than 10 percentage points you've got a toss-up i mean you've got the same thing in maryland's first district that's the one that stretches from uh, gaithersburg germantown all the way up to washington county in the end that's david trone's district in maryland right now but that is a race that the uh, dccc is saying uh, we could be vulnerable here, and then the Republican National Committee is definitely putting money into that, saying that he is a candidate that could potentially go down given the dynamic of the midterm. But that's Maryland. Their election's coming up in July. We're talking about Virginia right now. And I think that's all on my list of uh, the key districts here to highlight, but I definitely just wanted to, to show you here, Lorenzo, the differences between all of the districts, how the old map and the new map has mm -hmm. changed things around, and how it's made a lot of these races super tight. Yeah, and that's going to make November really interesting. Yeah. <laughs> all yeah. right, Adam, thank you. you all right, we want to check back in with the, uh, the other big race, the D.C. races. Again, polls closed at 8 p.m., an hour later than Virginia. And the race for mayor, the one that a lot of people are watching, you can see 62% of the precincts reporting. Incumbent mayor, Muriel Bowser, 51% of the vote so far. Robert White, a council member, 38%. Along with uh, council member Treon White at 9%. And you have businessman James Butler at 2%. And I want to go back to our Larry Miller, who is at council member Robert White's party at Hook Hall, a restaurant in Park View in Northwest. And uh, Larry, I understand that you've had some sort of a communication with the White campaign, yeah? Yeah, I, I spoke with the representative from the campaign. They told me just a minute ago uh, that they weren't going to be making any statements just yet. They told me that there are still votes to be counted and they are going to wait until more votes come in. Now, that was five minutes ago. 30 seconds ago, they said that they're going to be able to talk with us uh, in five minutes. And so we're not sure about the communication that the White campaign has had with the Bowser campaign. But certainly there's been a change in the past two conversations that I've had over the course of the last 10 minutes. We do know at this point, when we look at the wards and how the vote is shaping up right now, that Robert White uh, is only leading in one ward by about four percentage points. That's going to be Ward 1, which includes Columbia Heights, Mount Pleasant, Shaw, where we saw saw that deadly shooting uh, taking place over the weekend with that 15 year old killed. Uh, so again, we expect for him to talk about a number of different issues, but again, crime being one of those main issues that even as a councilman, he still wants to focus on, but it looks like there has been some acknowledgement of what has been decided and called by the Associated Press. We expect to hear from the campaign shortly. Lorenzo. All right, Larry Miller, thank you so much. Let us know uh, when uh, Robert White decides to come out. In the meantime, I want to go back to our Delia Gonzalez, who's at the Bowser's official campaign watch party at Franklin Hall. And uh, Delia, any word from Mayor Bowser's campaign yet? You know, the, the, we've talked to a lot of folks and people are piling in. Everyone is waiting for the mayor. I'm trying to get confirmation as to exactly when she will be here, uh, but we are hoping that she will be here sometime soon. You know, the mayor described herself as a 49-year-old single mother who is mayor of her hometown, and it appears, according to the Associated Press, that she will be mayor of her hometown for a third term, making her the only mayor other than the mayor for life, Marion Barry, to hold more than two terms here uh, in the District of Columbia. Marion Barry, of course, having three consecutive terms first, being elected in 1978 and then again in 82 and 86. And then he had a resurgence, came back and ran again and won for mayor in 1994. So this puts her up in the ranks of not only being mayor of her hometown for a third term, but again, joining the company of the mayor for life, Marion Barry, who has served 
um, this city for a very long time. And as you hear Go Go playing in the background, it is all about the district and it's all about the rebound that this city is making after COVID. But no doubt, because we are only three blocks away from that shooting and Shaw that Larry was talking about over at Mochella. That is on the minds of a lot of people here. We are celebrating, lots of folks here celebrating, no doubt, but everyone certainly concerned about the rise in crime. As I'm looking out the door, I can see a cruiser, um, an MPD officer driving by. The mayor says her initiative uh, to fight this crime, bring more officers into the city. She wants to hire 500 new additional officers to come into the city and that would boost the MPD police force to 4,000 uh, where uh, it should be, she says. Also other initiatives, the carjacking task force, she has teamed up with uh, Angela also Brooks, the county executive of Prince George's to really tackle and prevent these young people from committing carjackings, which we have seen on the rise as well. Lots of initiatives this summer to create a program where residents can connect to resources. Folks want to hear exactly what she's going to do. As I mentioned before, you know, Mayor Bowser really won in a landslide back in 2018 in that primary, winning the vote by 80%. Although the Associated Press called this race for Mayor Bowser fairly early with just about 50% of the vote, Council Member at Large Robert White uh, proved to be a fierce competitor at nearly 40% of the vote uh, very early on in the evening. And as you just recounted those numbers, uh, so certainly uh, there are still lots of votes to be counted and tallied. And we know the mayor has had a long day and we're hoping she will end her night here. And of course, her supporters are hoping it'll be a big celebration. And it seems like the party has already started without her. We are standing by. I wish I had uh, a better idea for you exactly as to when she will be here. But I am getting word that she will be here soon. And no doubt you can count on us to get all the updated information and get that reaction from Muriel Bowser, the 49-year-old single mother who is mayor of her hometown, it appears, for the third term. Yeah, a lot of folks are already calling her the next mayor for life. All right, Delia Gonzalez at Franklin Hall, where the party is likely going to go on for a good chunk of the night. Thank you, Dee. All right, let's check in again on some of those other major races in D.C. we've been following, including the race uh, for attorney general to replace outgoing AG, Carl Racine. You can see with 62 percent of the votes in, Brian Schwab there with 46 percent, Bruce Spiva at 36 percent, and Ryan Jones at 17 percent. Uh, and now to the many D.C. council spots up for grabs. A lot of folks focused on those. Now in the race for chairman of the council, you have incumbent Phil Mendelson there with 55 percent of the votes and his challenger Aaron Palmer at 44 percent. Now for the at large seat again, this seat is voted on by everyone in the district, not just in that particular ward. Uh, Anita Bonds, who's been there since 2012, uh, she has 38 percent of the vote. Nate Fleming, 27 percent. Lisa Gord, 27 percent. Dexter Williams at 7 percent. And the race for Ward 1 council member, you have incumbent Brianna Doe at 47 percent, uh, Salah Zapari at 32 percent, and Sable Harris at 21 percent. Now to the race for Ward 3 council member to replace Mary Che, who said she was not going to run again. Uh, and this race has been interesting, too, because you had a lot of candidates on the ballot initially, but so many of them later on, they later dropped out, like Matthew Fruman, who's here now, with 37 percent of the votes, Eric Goulet, 31 percent, Trisha Duncan at 6 percent. Uh, and then I believe uh, we have a few more now from uh, Ward 5 to replace Council Member Kenya McDuffie, who was originally running for Attorney General. But uh, uh, there was a challenge with one of his opponents there, and he got kicked off of the ballot, essentially. You have Zachary Parker in the lead there with 42% of the votes, Faith Gibson Hubbard, 23%, Vincent Orange at 17%. Now in the race for uh, D.C.'s House of Representatives seat, which uh, is essentially uh, you have here with the incumbent, longtime incumbent, Eleanor Holmes Norton, with 87 percent of the vote, 6 percent for Kelly McHale Williams and Wendy Hamilton at 6 percent. And for shadow representative, which is basically the elected D.C. statehood advocate, this person is always on the Hill fighting for D.C. statehood. You have incumbent Oye Owalawa at 49 percent 
and Linda Gray at 49% as well, cutting it pretty close with 62% of the votes in. And uh, now I want to go back, talk about that race for uh, D.C. mayor again. We were talking about Robert White, Mayor Mariel Bowser, the two leads in that case. And uh, Larry, you mentioned that, okay, there you have it. You have the man of the hour, Robert White. Yeah. Yes, you're, you're right, Lorenzo. We do have the man of the hour, Robert White here. Sir, how are you doing? I'm doing very well, thank you. Uh, probably not what you expected. You guys ran a competitive race. You guys were fighting hard, and to the end, you were crisscrossing the city today. Your thoughts about the results, and then what's next? First and foremost, I congratulate Major Mayor Bowser on, on her win. I look forward to working with her. Uh, what I've seen is tens of thousands of people across this city uh, who believe for the first time in a long time, who felt hope about what we can do as a city if we pull together. So I'm going to work with the mayor. I'm going to work with everybody who's working to address urgent issues in our city, public safety, a real comprehensive public safety plan, public education, understanding why our black and brown students are not doing better in our schools and working with other officials in our city. We can only do this work together. I'm ready to keep working. You have a lot of supporters to hear here tonight that are no doubt disappointed by the results. What do you want to say to so many people that voted for you tonight? The people who voted, uh, they didn't vote for me. They voted for themselves. They voted for the future of this city. They believe that we need to build a base of hope to build on. And so what I say to them is keep hoping because the work is still in front of us. Regardless of what positions we're in, regardless of the outcome of this race, we still have work to do and we have to do it together. You've been in this situation before. You've you know, competed in a race, lost, came back, you won again. Could we see you run for mayor again in the future? Look, you, you only fail if you stay down. I never stay down. It doesn't matter what position I'm in, I'm still working for the same end. So I don't know what the future is going to hold, but I do know this, I'm going to keep working. All right, Councilman White, thank you so much. Good thank luck you. to you, sir. Thank you. All right. So you just heard it there, hearing from the Councilman. Uh, the first interview that he's given since the Associated Press called it for Mayor Bowser again, saying that he will continue to work continue to work with other officials here in D.C. government to ensure the safety and the quality of life for all D.C. residents. As you can hear now, folks are starting to cheer. I'll let you listen to them and not for a moment. But again, this is an indication of just how excited people are for him. He was the candidate that the Bowser campaign was focused on because he was applying some of the greatest pressure to Mayor Bowser and her re-election bid. So today, while not the results that this campaign had hoped for, for him, the work is not over. He says that he will continue, and we expect, potentially, that he will be uh, running for mayor again, potentially, in the future at some point. Lorenzo? Yeah, Larry, you know, that has to be tough. I think of all, all of these candidates, you spend so much time campaigning, talking to folks, garnering all the support. Uh, hoping to carry out your vision that is not in the cards for Robert White in terms of DC's uh, DC's mayor, uh, but he is graciously bowing out and promising to continue working to improve the lives of district residents. Larry Miller, thank you so much. And you know that does it for us here. You can get the results from sent straight to your phone. By the way, text elections to that number on your screen 202-895-5599, and we'll send you links to our voter guides for both DC and Virginia. And we will have a complete wrap up tonight on WUSA 9 News at 11. Have a great night until then.